it's going to be easier for you to get a, a technology implant and implanted into your body versus taking the damn pill every single day. You're not compliant. You're going to forget. And it leads to things that are putting um, a debt on healthcare, right? Mm -hmm. Just like heart attack. So instead, why not just put the damn freaking chip in, right? Right. And that's the, that's the way I see their um, like mindset going into. Oh, I gotta go. I've been working, told them please don't hit my phone. I'm in my zone, bro. Just leave me alone. Was on the road, but I swear I'm coming home. Now the drinks on me, I think we need a toast. See, I did it for me. Now my old friends calling, told them nothing's for free. Told me time is money, dog. Swear I paid all my fees. I was starving for this game. Now my fan they can eat. Hey everyone. Welcome to another Cup of News episode with your boys, Peter and Matt here. Thank you everyone for taking time and tuning in to this episode. If you guys listen to our previous episodes and find any value in it, it takes a lot of time and effort for us to create these episodes. Please go ahead and take five seconds out of your time, smash the like, smash the five stars if you can. Perks, points, if you leave a comment on Apple Podcasts, this is what motivates us. We look at this stuff, it boosts us in the algorithm. And this is how we get motivated to keep on producing this high quality content. For anything related to us as far as announcements, what we're up to, cupofnurses.com and we are frontlinewarriors.com. Uh, same thing with the merch. I'm wearing the right now shirt. Pete's wearing the nurse shirt on the Cup of Nurses shop. Check it out. Purchase it for your boyfriend, girlfriend. Maybe your grandma wants to rock a rock shirt. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. If you want to tune into YouTube, we have a ton of things there, nursing debriefments, just interact with us. We, we love it. And we're developing this app that we've been talking about on multiple podcasts in the previous episodes. We're still working on it. It's coming out in Q1 of 2022, so stay tuned. It's called Pronto, and we're going to bridge the gap between healthcare, revolutionize it, innovate it, and do what we do best, you know? Try to try to make a difference in the world, and that's what we're always about, and that's what we do on the podcast. And yeah, hope you guys enjoy this episode. Thank you. How you doing, Pete? I'm doing great, Matthew. Thank you for the beautiful introduction. Today we are going to talk about the number one killer in America, and that is cardiovascular disease. We're also going to talk about some cardiovascular events like heart attacks, strokes, heart failures, and how we kind of treat them medically, and how the healthcare community kind of goes about and tackles these things. So cardiovascular disease, it's not really one thing you could say. It's it's like a series of things. It could be like a stroke, a heart attack, heart failure, valve problems. And it's not just like one disease. It's not just like, hey, you have cardiovascular disease, like, hey, you have the flu or, hey, you have multiple sclerosis. It's not just like one kind of disease. It's like this, this wide encompassing thing that usually takes like years and years of health neglect to kind of develop these things. And after, you know, you get this cardiovascular disease, you have to kind of start changing things around because some of these things are reversible. A lot of the major players with cardiovascular disease, you're going to always hear like hypertension, diabetes contributes to it. And then like those are reversible to a certain extent. But the fact is like sometimes they get so severe where you're going to have to kind of just live with, with these things, like kind of like diabetes. Um, I know this isn't a a diabetes talk, but a lot of times diabetes also contributes to cardiovascular disease. So for example, if you have uncontrolled diabetes, you have prediabetes, that's still reversible. You can still reverse that, change your your diet, change how, how much you move, how active you are, and then you can reverse that. But once you get diabetes and you become like insulin dependent or dependent on medication for lowering your blood sugar, then you know that's kind of sticking with you with you forever because it's a uh, cardiovascular disease, same with diabetes, is they're like silent silent diseases. Like you don't really feel anything different unless like unless your sugar is super high or you don't really feel anything unless your blood pressure is super high then you might get dizzy same with like your blood sugars when your blood sugar is super high you might get real thirsty something like that that you won't really know that your sugars are high or heart heart uh rate or blood pressure is elevated or if it's like in the medium you and it's like you're living there but you're constantly making making the or you're constantly creating this damage where it's just like you don't feel different but the damage is occurring and that's like the scariest aspect of it and then leads to like strokes and heart attacks yeah just like you said it's a chronic buildup you know and perfect example like my previous shift i just had a patient that uh came in for a STEMI. turns out that you know he's hypertensive we got to start him on some new meds and his hbo1c is 6.5 so newly diagnosed diabetes and that's like that perfect clinical picture that we always mm. see that um 
is talked about. And it, yeah, just like you said, it just takes time. This doesn't just happen overnight. Right. And at Loki, I've seen in a hospital, I feel like there, there's definitely, and I'm trying to, I, I've we've been seeing, or I've been seeing more DKAs lately and then more um, like strokes. So that's, that's pretty interesting. More neuro patients, like same with EVDs. So I don't know if it's that time of year, I guess, because we're now technically we're during the whole C-19 still, you know, because we're recording this episode still uh, mid-January, you know, and then like the patient population is already kind of switching. Like when we first came to Texas, we were seeing a little bit more C-19. Now I feel like it's just all neuro and like DKA. Back to the basics mm-hmm. in a way. So when we talk about heart disease, we could first talk about atherosclerosis, and that is the, the development of plaque that's building up in these audio walls. So uh, there's different things that uh, contribute to it. We've been kind of in the past, you know, focused on trans fats, saturated fats. And as you, we always talk about that, it's probably less of that, maybe more diabetes where uh, you have high sugars, the macrophages are trying to clean up the excess sugar. It's causing the scarring, this, this buildup of the plaque. So uh, basically the arteries are narrowing, they're becoming stiffer and you have more chances of um, gl- blood clots from forming and then also the blockage of blood flow to certain parts, which in this case, if it's um, up in the vasculature of the brain, it could lead to a stroke. And if it's the near the coronaries, you're going to have your heart heart mm-hmm. attack. And it's like these these things, um, like when you're in your, in your body, your cell, individual cells don't have a brain like you do as a human. So... If you don't change, if you don't start eating healthier, if you don't start exercising, then your body is going to keep producing this plaque. They're going, it's going to uh, cause this stenosis because like your body th- doesn't know what's a safe amount of stenosis and what's not a safe amount of stenosis. It, it just, it's just going to stenose no, no matter what. And doesn't know how much plaque is, is good and how much plaque is bad. It's going to still build up because of your, your diet and your stagnant lifestyle. Like There's no like internal thought process going on and saying, hey, let's put this plaque somewhere else in our circulatory system. It's, it's going to build wherever it builds. It's not like it's going to be to like say, hey, we're going to stop building this plaque in, in your brain. Let's kind of push it more down towards where your kidneys are. You know, it's not going to spread out evenly. It, it just happens and then it just builds up and then, you know, you, you suffer basically an injury. I know I was, we we're going to talk about heart attacks. So heart attacks, that's when your blockage, um, there are two types of heart attack. There's a STEMI and an NSTEMI. When you get a STEMI in a hospital, you have ST segment elevation. So when you look at a like a heart monitor, you have the P wave, QRS, and a T at the end. So ST elevation, it shows that your ST, you could say wave, is elevated, and that kind of shows that there's some kind of a damage. And NSTEMI is non-ST elevated myo- myocardial infarction, which means that there hasn't been any damage done, but it's almost like you got lucky. And then it still happened, but it might be maybe your your coronary was like 80% occluded and happened to spasm. And then that, that gave you that chest pain that kind of showed like you're having a heart attack. Even though it's not 100% occluded, it still was 80% and you had a spasm, which made you seem like you had a heart attack. And it's kind of showing you, having an end stem, you're showing you, hey, that if you don't change something about your lifestyle, exercise, or, or diet, the next one's going to be stemming. Next one, you're actually going to have damage. And that damage doesn't really go away. It's really hard for that damage to go away because once our tissues lose oxygen and they lose blood flow, well, they, they die. And, you know, your cardiac system and same with, with your brain, it doesn't really re- regenerate. A heart muscle luckily can regenerate a little bit, you could say better than, than, your, than your brain. But once the damage is there, it's there. You can't bring a dead heart muscle from death back to life. There's things that we could do to kind of help alleviate uh, that function that's missing, but it's still not going to be the... Be the uh, a same same heart, unfortunately, you know. And then you could once you have a heart attack, then it leads to other problems. Once you have like a full heart attack, an enstemi, that's going to slowly contribute to all these other cardiac issues that we're going to mention, like heart failure and all that kind of things. But luckily, I think ninety percent of people, when they had their first heart attack, uh, they don't suffer any kind of um, debilitating issues, so they could go back to life. N- as, as they were before the heart attack, but it's a sign that's, that's showing you, hey, you got to change something because next one, you're probably going to get harmed in some way. Yeah, and that's the unfortunate part that it's the number one killer and it's such a such a big thing in our Western society that we could easily prevent. So we're going to talk about some medications and some lifestyles and what a doctor would recommend uh, depending on how bad your heart attack is, but we could go over some interventions of what happens in the hospital setting when you get a heart attack. So uh, typically, what you get is the angioplasty, 
that is just a ballooning and like potentially stenting also of the the heart attack of where the uh, occlusion is. So basically, they thread a special tubing in there. Uh, they usually go in through the arteries as far as the radial access, so in uh, next to your arms there by your thumb, or they're going to go through the groin, uh, depending on what's easier. I know it's always easier to go through the groin, um, but also it kind of creates more complications uh, post-procedure because you have to be laying flat for a long time after the sheath was taken out. So most doctors like to go through the radio approach where you can still move around, you could elevate your bed, you know, 30 degrees, and you just have uh, the TR band is what they mostly uh, have in the hospitals. You just inflate the, um, the balloon where the sheath is, and then bam. So angioplasty is the most thing where they kind of go in there, they basically balloon the, um, the plaque, and they try to open up the occlusion. So if you have like an 80% occlusion, hopefully you can get like 30, 40% afterwards. Depends on what the cardiac cath is going to show. So mm -hmm. the whole point is to open up blood flow back to the coronary arteries. So you're preventing the, you're, you're, you're hoping so the heart could oxygenate again because you're losing the dead muscle cells from poor oxygenation. Mm -hmm. uh, they also have an angioplasty laser, which I'm not too familiar, familiar with. Uh, but that's just uh, like a laser guided tip that opens up the blocked arteries. Mm. That's kind of cool. Uh, I know they do that for um, the kidney stones sometimes mm. in the ureters, but I don't see it as as much in the um, the heart procedures. Yeah. Uh, you could also have a artificial heart valve surgery, so that's going to replace uh, the valve. You have the tricuspid or mitral, depending on where your heart disease is, and you want to replace. Um, you know, if you're creating regurgitation and uh, like. Mostly, you want to. Um, mostly, what happens is the first time you get a heart attack, your valves are fine because you didn't have any damage to begin with. But if you have multiple stents, you have a second heart attack. That's where these valves are going to start taking damage. There could be a, like you know, the backflow of blood that could be mixing into like the uh, left atrium. It could cause AFib. So we want to get that under control. And there's different procedures that we're going to talk about. Mm. So. Yeah, the last thing you could do, ath atherectomy is another one, Another one, if I'm pr uh, pronouncing that right, but that's basically similar to the balloon angioplasty that Matt mentioned, but instead mm -hmm. of just blowing up that balloon and making the, the vessel bigger, you're actually kind of going in and scraping off that plaque, so you're actually removing some of that plaque. That's sometimes seems to be, be a best fit, but of course, you know, you have that also risk of, you know, um, some of that plaque breaking off and throwing clots, so it's not for everybody. That's why, you know, there's so much options because not everybody is going to be candidate for every single single procedure. Yeah, I've, I've seen a lot of those in the carotids. That's mm, what they usually do yeah. uh, to prevent the strokes. Yeah, it's easier in the, the, the bigger range. vessels for sure than the smaller ones. You know, another one could be cardio, um, like a, a bypass surgery, cardiopulmonary bypass. Uh, this isn't usually like a first. It's not usually like the first round of, of things that you can do because usually we do a bypass on somebody that kind of already suffered damage. So sometimes. You might may have had the the STEMI with the ST segment elevation where it showed damage, but the damage might not have might not be severe enough for you to need need to do a bypass. So basically, a bypass is is basically reperfusing an area that's getting perfused very poorly or not being perfused at all. So they basically take a vessel from somewhere outside your body and they basically sew it on uh, to your heart. You could say because let's say if your coronaries are are occluded 100%. And you know they can't stent you or whatever, and and then that part of the heart is losing that that blood flow because because you have like these little blood vessels in your heart. They're called coronaries, and of course each each tissue, each muscle has a few of them, few of them that's going into them. It's not just like one coronary artery going into, into each thing. There's multiple ones of them. So sometimes the occlusion is so bad, or there's multiple occlusions where you're better off just taking a vessel from like your thigh or somewhere else in your body and attaching it from like the aorta, or sorry, not the aorta, but the, well, technically it would be the, the aorta, or wherever the physician decides, it might be another place from where your greater vessels are in your heart, and it's attaching it to where that perfusion is lacking. It's literally like adding adding in an artery or adding a, a vein into your heart, you could say, and then that's reperfusing it, because if you're, let's just say you have like five coronary coronaries that are perfusing one part of, of the heart, and let's say three of them are completely occluded, well then, yeah, it's still being perfused by those two, two of them that are left, but it's not being perfused enough. You still need to have better blood flow because your heart might have to work harder and that could that contribute to heart failure, or then you're also risking those two also being clotted off. So they might just attach another piece of, of tissue, a vessel 
that is going to reperfuse that area. Pretty pretty crazy. Like whoever invented that invented that surgery was probably fucking smart as fuck. Like it's crazy. And it's like it's interesting how adaptive your body is, how you could do something like that. Like it's almost like pipes in your in your home. If like one pipe's occluded, you could say instead of removing that pipe, you could just kind of bridge it with a different pipe. If that yeah, makes kind of sense. And that's also fascinating with like angiogenesis where mm. your body's smart enough that knows that hey a certain part of your body is lacking blood flow and it's literally developing collateral um, vessels around that. So mm. some patients might have bad atherosclerosis, but you don't have to do such uh, crazy intervention because they have good collaterals. Mm. Exactly. And, and their body was adapting to whatever was happening. Yeah, and it's, it's so interesting like when you actually like, explore kind of medicine and how things are done in a hospital. Another one is cardiomyoplasty. This is something I actually had to look up. And this is when they actually <clears throat> reinforce your heart muscle with a different muscle. They just take it from like the deltoid area and they wrap it around your around your heart and they add a pacemaker to it. So it could have the same heart rate as your regular heart and it helps pump it because when you have a lot of heart damage, what happens is, is, is your heart grows, it gets bigger. A lot of people think that it's a good thing, right? That your heart gets bigger, it can pump stronger. It can, but then technically it's become a less hollow on the inside, which which means that there's more muscle there, but not enough uh, volume in the chambers because the muscle grows, so it shrinks the chambers in there. So technically, you have less blood volume. So this is kind of like almost a, a, a fix. And instead of having your your heart get bigger and clamping down on these chambers and the volume, you're at reinforcing muscle around it, so it could still kind of pump harder and just kind of make up for that area that it, that is damaged. I have haven't had a patient like this, but this seems like a very uh, cool idea, cool concept. It's still like in the experimental phase, so not everybody could, could get it, but something that could also be promising in the in the future. Uh, there's also heart transplant when you have a very, very severe damage, and this is kind of like your last shot in life because we can't do anything past a heart transplant. The Grim Reaper is knocking. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's just like, if you already are on transplant list, you know, you're already kind of basically counting down days. I, I worked in a lot of I worked in a heart failure unit and that's basically how it was. We would I know we're not talking about heart failure right now, we're gonna talk about it a little bit later. But a lot of times, you know, once you have heart failure, it's a progressive thing. A lot of times if you don't make serious life changes, diet, exercise, and sometimes your heart failure is that is that bad where you can't make any changes because adding any kind of exercise you put straight on the heart and you're better off just being more stagnant than than you know, than than active. And that's like one of the end stages where it kind of sucks to see because person needs the heart and they can't exercise, they can't fix it. It's ir it's irreversible. It's Your heart's too big, your heart's already too damaged and you just need, need a new heart. And it's, it's a very unfortunate situation to be in. Yeah, there's also radio frequency ablations and that's a catheter tip that gets guided through the veins or heart muscles and destroy selected heart muscles. It almost sounds like the ablation surgeries that they do to prevent um, arrhythmias. Uh, we have a stent procedure, which is the most common thing that you're usually going to get when you have a non STEMI or STEMI, depending on what's going on and how bad the occlusion is. So they just kind of go in there and put a wire mesh uh, post angioplasty. And usually you're going to be on Plavix afterwards to prevent the, the sticking of uh, platelets on the stent itself. Mm. Our next, next topic up is going to be strokes. There is, right, uh, there's actually one more, isn't there? There's yeah. like, yeah. So it's transmyocardic revascularization. So this one, this one was actually really fucking interesting because I looked it up there before the show and I never knew that they could do this before. So basically <clears throat> what they do when Matt mentioned angiogenesis, like your body forming new, um, new blood vessels to different areas. So what this actually does is if they go near that area that needs, needs uh, blood flow and they actually laser shoot holes in your heart. And then what happens is a claw forms on the outside of your of, of your heart to you know stop you from from bleeding out of your heart, but what happens is blood goes into those those holes you could say, and your body almost figures out a way to to use that blood and revascularize that area. So it's something I never knew you could, you could even do. It's literally like when I was looking at it, it looked like the, a cheese grater. Now there's so much holes in cheese grater. It's, it's they something like that, and then your body naturally clots it off, and then your body just forms blood vessels where those chambers are that, that are packing up blood. So it's like you're using your body's own natural abilities to mm -hmm. to do something because you're designated that target area. That's pretty dope. Yeah. My only thought process on that was like, would that make you more prone to clotting then? Like when you clot, if you think about it, because if blood's always pooling there, 
then you're going to have a great chance of claw formation, right? Yeah, to me, it sounds like it's just temporary because of what the lasers do. No, it's permanent. And then it prevents that. No, it's permanent. It, it, get, it gets clots, it clots off at the outside of the heart, but the blood always goes there. So, so it's basically almost like your corner, your, your heart is, is getting, it's, it's taking blood from those little chambers that, that are holes. You know, so it becomes part of like your your, your cardiovascular, almost like becomes it's part a of the chamber. Okay. Yeah, it's crazy. But my only thing is like if blood's always pooling there and there's you know blood's being used from those chambers or those little little holes that you technically have in, in your heart, that'll be prone to clots. I feel like, you know, but they're real small. But who knows? You know, it's, it's, all, over it's all part of the game. I mean, I watched that Netflix documentary like Bleeding Edge, and it's crazy because we always talk about the pharmaceutical industry and all these industries, how they're making like billions of dollars, but the the medical device industry is huge. Mm. It's it's even a bigger sector, but it's like a silent thing. And if you, th if you think about it, it's just cosmetic surgery that's invasive, that's always taking place. You always see those uh, commercials for like endometriosis. They're, they started bleeding again because they tried to stop the ovaries or whatever. And these devices were um, defected mm -hmm. and all that. So it's a huge industry that uh, doesn't get as much exposure, but it's it's it makes billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's definitely on the rise now that we have like people thinking of having chips implanted into our brains and all that shit. Like I feel so pills and medicines are being like the forefront now because something so simple but then and then and then we're all getting we're all seeing that happen because it's so simple it's so popular but i feel like 10 20 30 years down the line when these devices become more popular they're going to undergo the, the 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 same scrutiny as these pharmaceuticals and medicines i feel like with devices it's really you really have to it's really almost hard to fuck up and it's really hard to play the system like the way pharmaceuticals do right because it's very hard to convince somebody to get a surgery versus cons uh, con um, versus have somebody hop on a pill because it's a pill is like you're not really changing anything every day. You're not really going in for anything. It's something that you just pop in your mouth, you swallow, and you go about your day. Maybe it changes your life, maybe for a minute, or two minutes. But having a, a device implanted, you have to be more accurate, and you can't just have all these devices and these like you know trials being being done on, on, on people because it's it's more inconvenient for us to, to do. If you could just like give like a shot and you release nanoparticles or give a shot and you, you got a pacemaker now, then I feel like those would be a lot under more scrutiny and more under, under the stethoscope, you could say, or under the microscope because you just don't see them as, as much compared to pharmaceuticals where just a pill where it's so easy to, to do compared to like put a pacemaker. It's a lot easier to give you like amiodarone PO than it is to put a pacemaker in. So you're yeah. always going to have that kind of the volume kind of thing. Yeah, and it's interesting because on the episode where we talked about the metaverse, we talked about transhumanism and that's something that we can't escape. They're going to push towards that. So like the way I see it is all like these industries that are making these pharmaceutical pills are just going to convert from PO medicine to literally brain engineering or computing and doing all these uh, devices and making um, us like part cyborgs. And right. it's going to be technically be more efficient because uh, you're completely fixing the problem, I guess, in this sense, instead of giving you a pill for 10 years of your life to do the thing. Well, now you're going to have a machine that's going to just do that instead. And it's it's going to be convenient, right? Mm -hmm. Just like technology and cell phones make it easier for certain things. Well, it's going to be easier for you to get a, a technology implant and implanted into your body versus taking the damn pill every single day. You're not compliant. You're going to forget. And it leads to things that are putting um, a debt on healthcare, right? Mm -hmm. Just like heart attacks. So instead, why not just put the damn freaking chip in, right? Right. That's the, that's the way I see their um, like mindset going into the future. And there's even like robots right, doing, doing the surgery, like ESRP surgery. If you guys, look, if you guys want to look that up. Like that's almost completely done by a robot. Literally, a physician just sits behind like a monitor, and you, you could you, you could and it help helps guide this robot into doing these like things. Like Da Vinci. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's crazy because like if you think about it, think of like the automotive industry back in the industrial revolution, everything was made by humans, and then look how efficient they make cars now. Now it's like minimal human interaction. It's all pieced to, pieced together by a robot. So just imagine where you know we're gonna be in like fifty years, a hundred years. It's gonna be 
done by a robot because if they get the, the measurements right, imagine they could scan your body, figure out where everything is, and you're already sedated, intubated, you're not moving, no chance for, for any kind of, um, you know, incorrect calculation. If, if you say, because if, if you lay somebody on, on their back and you sedate them, paralyze them or whatever, and they're not moving, and you scan their whole body and you can figure out where everything is, you could have a robot just do everything for you if you think about it, which is going to minimize the the chance of error because, yeah, even though a surgeon might be well experienced in the, in the surgery, you know, you could still do something by accident compared to a robot where it's like it just does whatever the input does yeah. because there's Never. no, there's no like, like chance of patient, like a robot being overworked or tired or having a bad day or somebody pissing them off. There's no emotion into it. It's just straight business and just does whatever it's, 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 it's uh, inputs are put in and then it, it gives you whatever the output is. Yeah, it just reminds me of the movie uh, Elysium with Matt Damon where like uh, basically they escaped. There's a uh, basically billionaire civilization like on the moon, whatever. And you, you have like these pods and you just like sit down in this pod. It does like a scan and it eliminates all cancer. And then the machine's like, you're cancer free. Yeah, you get to business. go. <laughs> yeah, it's wild. Yeah. So the next topic we're going to cover are strokes. And you have two types of strokes, one of them being ischemic, the other one hemorrhagic. So when it comes to ischemic stroke, that's literally a clot or something that's occluding the blood vessel that's leading, uh, perfusing the blood. And that's why you always hear in uh, strokes, time is brain. Uh, the second one is hemorrhagic strokes, and that's literally a burst blood vessel that's preventing blood to perfuse into the brain. Uh, and that's usually due to poor vasculature slash hypertension is the most common cause. And you see this often like in the, the sticky that I worked where you just have patients that are old, frail, fell, boom, stuff bursted. And it gets a lot worse when they're on medication like Eliquis, which is the more, more preferred medication versus, versus Coumadin because of the testing, but there's nothing to reverse it. And you're just monitoring this person and hopefully the, the body's able to do its thing. The, the pill is gonna uh, leave the body and you could um, stop the blood from, the bre or the blood vessel from bleeding out. Mm. And this is so it's like a double-edged sword. So let's just say there isn't really like, okay, if I was to choose a cardiovascular disease like hypertension or something or coronary artery disease, which one's better than the other? You know, really, there's there's really no, you could say, better or, or easier one to live with because if you have hypertension and you might not be more prone to clotting, well, guess what? You could cause a hemorrhagic stroke. Or if you don't have hypertension, but you know, you're still stagnant and you're building a plaque, well, guess what? You should still suffer a stroke, an ischemic stroke. So it's kind of like really there's no way out of this and there's no kind of way in selecting like, you know, one disease over, over, over the other. And with strokes, it kind of sucks because there's not like a lot to do. You're honestly safer off, if you want to consider it that way, having a heart attack than, than, than a stroke. But then either way, it's scary. Either way, it could fuck you up for life. For like, if somebody comes in for an ischemic stroke, the first thing they're going to ask you is, when was the last time oh, that you remember being normal? Or if somebody else is there with you, when is the last time that you remember having your mom be normal how she is? Because when you have a ischemic stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke, stroke, either one, you have some neurological changes. It might have, you might have facial droop. You might not be able to see on one eye if it's an occipital lobe issue. You might not be able to walk. You might have tremors. You might not be able to comp comprehend. You might have aphasia. A lot of things that could go wrong. But if you come in with an ischemic stroke, we're always going to ask you when was your last normal? Because if your last normal was, was about three hours ago and some sort of circumstances about 4.5, then there's something that we could administer called ATP, which is called out the place. And it's basically a clot buster. We inject it through your, through your veins. We could either do it systematically or just directly into that one area. I feel like I see it systematically more common, commonly than to direct our, uh, the direct location. I'm not sure how it is for you, but I feel like systemic is a little bit more, more uh, is done a little bit more just because it's a little bit easier to do than directly in there. And that's basically us trying to dissolve a clot. But the thing is, like, let's say you have an ischemic stroke and you, you also fell. Even though you might not have any visual bleeding or any kind of bleeding going on, we're probably still going to hold off that ATP because what that ATP is going to do, no matter what, it's going to go throughout your system. And if you, let's say, have a micro bleed somewhere that's not in, in on a scan, like somewhere else in your brain, like you happen to fall, could because of your ischemic stroke and you might have like a hemorrhagic stroke developing somewhere, but we can't find it because it's super small because we can't see everything. So we're going to hold that off because you fell. Because what might happen is, yeah, we might fix that 
ischemic stroke, you might get rid of that clot that's blocking off the blood to your brain. But since you have that micro rupture in your other part of your brain and a micro bleed, guess what? Now, since you gave ATP, that bleed is going to be even bigger and bigger and bigger. Or maybe you have a uh, micro bleed in your pelvis or somewhere else or in your GI tract. It's going to to propagate that bleeding and you're going to plunge your blood out and die because that's how strong this medication is. Yeah, and that's why CT scans are the gold standard as well before you administer TPA to make sure and rule yourself out of the uh, the hemorrhagic right. stroke. Even if, you didn't, if, even if you didn't fall, we're going to CT you no matter what because it shows us that A, where the, the ischemia is and then B, potentially a bleed that you might not feel or we, we might not just know about it's su super crazy we and then they go straight to the icu afterwards they go to go to icu for monitoring because there is a still a prolonged chance of you bleeding somewhere else which is which is which is wild. Like if some of the varices and you get you get tpa and then you know someone ha happen, happens to get irritated and that that ruptures like you're pretty much fucked because you know we're not be reversed in time because it's a it's a clap it's stronger than than you know a hyperinfusion which which you usually give for ischemic strokes too afterwards. And the second thing that you can do is a thrombectomy, like a mechanical one. So what happens is the doctor is just gonna go in there with like a wired cage device called a stent retriever. And they're going to thread a catheter in the artery or into the groin. And they're basically gonna stent and try to grab this clot. Uh, they have like a special suction device that's, that's attached to it and they're gonna remove the clot. Mm -hmm. And this also kind of rem reminded me of um, like the aneurysms that they have. So if you have a, like an aneurysm that's maybe causing you to have a headache and they want to prevent that from rapture, rapturing, rupturing. The rapture. To, yeah, I know. It's coming, guys. It's Jesus coming. is coming. Um, to prevent you from developing hemorrhagic stroke, they're going to literally guide a wire there and they're going to put like the, the wire mesh into the aneurysm to prevent that from... Um, like reinforce it, right? From like, yeah, just breaking because you're going to redirect blood flow basically. Right. A third one on here on the list is probably the craziest one out of all of, all of this is, is heart failure. So you get, there's different classes of heart failure. We're not going to go in depth in each class of heart failure, but there's a lot of them. There's a lot of different scales that you, you could look at. And doctors are very educated, and very knowledgeable on this. Like it was always cool seeing that like uh, when I used to work in Chicago, like, hey, this person has heart failure class, this, this, and this, and then they treated it depending on that. But we're not gonna go in depth into that. But heart failure happens, you get diagnosed with heart failure, when there is so much damage in, in your heart, you have so much uncontrolled hypertension, or you've had a bunch of heart attacks, or you have a bunch of occlusions that they can't operate on, and we can't do any intervention, so your heart starts to work harder and harder and harder and harder and harder, and eventually you go into heart failure, where it's almost an irreversible thing. I believe that a lot majority of people, once they get diagnosed with any kind of stage of heart failure, it's basically going to progress from there, and there's really, not a lot of things you could do and you're eventually going to die from the heart failure. Like if you catch it, if you do it early on where you have like the first class of heart failure, like you could still do every, every normally. Like that's like a serious lifestyle change. Like, hey, no, this is my life now with heart failure. This is, I, I have this forever now and it's time to change because once you're in heart failure, it's very hard to reverse it and get out of, out of heart failure. Like you, that's gonna be with you for the rest of your life, like, like diabetes and it's, it's very intense. Yeah, and that's why also after you having a heart attack, they do echoes usually uh, post-op day one after the stent to see what is your ejection fraction that you're, that you're uh, experiencing. Sometimes, just like we mentioned, the first first time something might not happen, second time you're ruining that ejection fraction, which leads you into the higher risks of developing um, heart failure. Yeah, and there's a lot of ways you go into heart failure. You go into heart failure because of valve issues. You go into heart failure because of hypertension. You go into heart failure because you have a lot of ischemic cardiac damage because you have a lot of plaque because your coronaries are, are plaqued up. There's, there's not, it's not just like, it's not just like you have hypertension, then you got heart failure. It's a lot of things contribute to it. And there's a lot of different means of getting heart failure from not just necessarily one. It's right. not just saying like, Hey, if you get heart failure, you have to have a valvular disease. No, you don't. If, if it's to say, it's saying like you, you are going to have heart failure because your coronaries are, are covered with plaque, not necessarily. It's, it comes from a multi, multi noodle, multi, multimodal things, if that makes sense. If I'm yeah. using the correct word. And then also depends, and you want to treat the underlying cause too. For example, if it's left, left sided heart failure, right sided heart failure, maybe you have right sided heart failure due to pulmonary hypertension where you're having a backup of blood into the right atrium slash right ventricle. So you want to offload that, do maybe some vasodilators to mm. help with the blood flow back there and 
you will have different symptoms based on what kind of heart failure you have. Mm-hmm. Um, so some things that we do for treatments that we talked about already is the coronary bypass surgery. So I'm not going to go into much detail, but you're grafting a leg and you're putting in new blood vessels to redirect that blood flow uh, that's causing you to have that blockage. Uh, you have um, heart valve repair and replacement um, that depends on what's happening and what's damaged. So they want to repair the flaps of the valves or remove excess tissue of the leaflets. Uh, sometimes you might have endocarditis and they do an echo and they see that uh, there's regurgitation because the bacteria ate, ate the valves. You might go in there and get like a TAVR procedure or sometimes they place like a ring and they help reinforce that valve that's um, that's more tighter fit. <laughs> I don't have the, the professional terminology for it because we're not heart surgeons here, but you know, they, they make sure it's working right. Uh, we also have implantable ICDs, which are implantable cardio defibrillators. And you want to prevent the heart from going into crazy rhythms that usually happens when you have heart failure because you have the poor perfusion. Mm. Um, that's usually implanted uh, into your left chest wall, and there's wires that get guided into the, um, the what is it called, the ventricles, uh, depending on if you have a dual chamber or single chamber one. It's kind of like a pacemaker. Yeah. But is there from a lot more like emergency than anything else? A lot of times, if you get an IIC, it usually comes with a pacemaker just in case. Because, you, you know, let's just say, for example, your heart goes into a weird rhythm. So we recommend, or goes into VTAC. So now we recommend getting this ICD. But then again, if you're prone to getting a VTAC, then you might also be prone to getting like bradycardic or other cardiac arrhythmia. So we might just give you the pacemaker and uh, AICD a- a- just, just because, you know, why don't we go in there a second time if, you know, if you have this history of doing this. And also before we like implant the, the ICD, sometimes we do it right away. Sometimes what happens is we put somebody on like a, a, a cardio vest where they wear a, a vest throughout, throughout their day and it literally monitors their, their heart rate every second of the day. Then we take it off when they go shower and they wear it because they might not feel anything, but your heart might go into VTAC every, every so often and you might not even know about it. Or you might, it might be bradycardic and you might not even know about it. Like you might just get lightheaded randomly throughout the day and it might be because you're bradycardic. So we don't just throw in these devices in you just, just because. A lot of times we want to first monitor you and actually evaluate like, hey, what's the best approach? Because we don't want to go in there twice, you know? We got to figure out what's actually going on. Yeah, and then also with these ICDs, I remember when patients were into hospice or end of life, uh, we, would ha- we would place that magnet on this mm-hmm. ICD just so when the freaking patient's heart stops beating, it doesn't like shock them continuously. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. I don't know how that works. Like, It turns it do, off. Do you call a company and do you just turn that off? Or I forget, do we just... Because usually I went home sometimes. Like, so, what, does the magnet just chill there for the X does. amount of time? Yeah, so I had, I did that a lot back in back when we were living in Chicago. Is yeah, we would we can't turn off. You gotta have a device nurse that that goes in and then like they log in and they have to change the settings on the AICD to turn it off. Yeah. But the only thing that we could do as as nurses because we don't know how to do that is just put the magnet on. So in our unit, we had like three magnets just. And it's like a little magnet, like it was on the cabinets, the metal cabinets in, uh, in, in yeah. our ACM's office. You just take that, put it on their chest, and you tape it so when you turn them or whatever to clean them up, then it doesn't, doesn't shock them, you know? Because it, like that device is going to shock them no matter what. So if the patient is peacefully trying to die and, you know, they go from 60s and the pacemaker program to shock them at 60 or back up pace them at, at 60, and it's going to work no matter what. And you, you don't want that happening because you're – you're not, I mean, you could be making a patient super uncomfortable because you don't know how they're feeling. They're, they're you know, actively dying and you, you don't know if, if it hurts some because they're given, they're literally giving little, little shocks and you just don't, you just don't want to be in a situation. Another device here is cardiac resynchronization therapy, which is very similar to the ICD where it's hooked up to the ventricles. But they usually do this when, for example, you have, you had a heart attack and now your the pacemakers of your heart um, is not, it's synchronized so it means that like your your right side of the heart might be offbeat with with the left and it's not singing properly so it's going to cause cause a valve issues in the future because there's always random pressure going through and you're not going to be able to have a good cardiac output you're not going to be able to perfuse your your cells properly so what they do is they hook this this up and it basically paces them in sync with each other very similar to a pacemaker or, or an AIC you could say but this is just strictly for the ventricles Another one, this one's kind of like your last resort before the heart, plant, heart transplant. It's called a ventricular assist device. Um, for all the nurses out there that have worked with one of these, especially in the ICU, this isn't um, a very uh, fun 
thing to kind of work with in a nursing field, especially in the ICU. On, on the floors, it's not as bad because you know they're on the floor, so they're not super critically ill. But when someone has, has a VAD and they're very sick and their heart's very bad, and they're maybe at their end or stages of life, you could say, a VAD's a scary thing, thing to have. So it's basically implanted into you like a centrifuge. So usually we do a left-sided. So an LVAD we call left ventricular assist device where we literally open up your chest, put a machine in that kind of, that works the same way that your left ventricle works. It gets, it gets pumped in with blood and then it shoots that blood out to your respiratory system through your aorta. So it's hooked up from your left ventricle and it goes out the aorta. And a lot of times uh, the aortic valve doesn't work or sometimes they even um, suture it shut so there's no kind of backflow regurgitation. But that's kind of like our last means. And this person literally has a cord coming out of their abdomen and they're reliant on this machine because you can't turn this machine off. This, this machine has to be on forever and this person is always gonna be dependent on this machine because if you unplug it or the battery dies or it turns off, then it's almost like there's no pumping going on from your left side of the heart to your aorta. So you're not putting out any blood. So this is very super scary to work with, especially at the end of the stages because a lot of times um, these VADs over time, it's not something that you could do do forever. It adds like maybe five years, possibly 10 years to someone's life. Sometimes they use it as, as um, therapy for the rest of their life or sometimes they use it as like a bridge to transplant. So a person might have this, their heart is so bad, but they're on the transplant list to get a heart, and this LVAD is going to keep them alive long enough for them to get a heart transplant eventually. So is your bridge to therapy or a bridge to, to transplant is our two options. So the therapy one is basically them having a forever, bridge to transplant is them having until somebody finds a, a heart for them. But the craziest thing about this is that every time you have a foreign object in your blood, there's always going to be some breakdown of red blood cells. So the longer you have this device in, the higher likelihood of your red blood cells getting broken down. So you're going to be on Kuma for the rest of your life. But the thing is, they're still getting red blood cells breaking down. And there's going to be a point eventually where more and more RBCs get broken down. And you're going to hit this point where now you have a lot of RBCs getting, getting broken down. And that's caused you to get acidotic. It's causing you to drop your kidney function and you can't live like this for very long. So they come in for, um, I forgot what the term is, uh, something lysis, hemolysis, yeah. yeah. Where your blood is basically getting hemolyzed and broken down, chopped up, and it's releasing all this, this these substances that are in your in your RBCs, which is making you acidotic, which is causing you kidneys, kidneys to fail and you're not even perfusing your body and it increases the fluid because you have a lot of, a lot of other stuff in in your RBC, you're in your RBCs besides like the the um, the thing that carries the oxygen. Yeah, what's it called? Hemo hemo something. Can't even think about it. hemoglobin. Hemo hemo hemoglobin. So there's Damn, more than really blanking yeah, out right no, now. <laughs> there's more inside your RBC than there's hemoglobin. There's other substances there that make it function, make it work, and when those get broken down, they're not supposed to be in your system, and they they basically almost like make make you toxic internally and eventually you die you start pissing out blood your blood your urine gets super black and you can't you can't function without it All right, so this reminds me of a patient i had back in the day i didn't have the patient but it was a patient on a unit uh back in the day he had an lvad and he didn't really take care of himself and he had this whole hemolysis going on i think it was like the second time or a third time that uh that he was in icu for these kind of issues he just, he just didn't i don't know he just didn't care or for whatever whatever reason and so on this LVAD, you have like the RPMs, rotation per minute. You have the the flows, which is how much volume it pushes out. And then you have like the watts, the, the power. And each each uh, numbers are geared towards individual. But in this person's case, is his LVAD was clotting off, um, you could say. And it made the RPMs go up real high. So when his RPMs went up real high for a long time, uh, it would burn him. Because when things speed up, it's like a car, like when you burn rubber and you you know you you turn your tires it gets it gets warm and you get smoke coming out of there he didn't have any smoke coming out but it was literally burning his chest like you could put your hand on, on his chest when rpms went up and it felt hot and he was literally getting burned internally from that and a th crazy thing was where um this i, I want to say this was before we had coverage on nights where we couldn't turn it off we had a physician physician need to come in and turn it off so he was there for like i want to say an hour or something around there where he was just getting burned intermittently from the inside out. And then we had to figure out a way to turn it off, but it was a crazy situation because he wasn't super old. I think it was like in his forties or something like that. And like we had, we had to turn it off. That was, that was the only way of saving him. 
from that pain. But the thing is, if he turned it off, he was going to die because there's no blood being being circulated. His case was a little bit interesting because his aortic valve was still opened. So even when we were going to turn, to turn this off, we knew that he was going to live for a little bit because, you know, your heart's still going to pump. It's just not going to pump enough blood to have you alive for the next year or for the next, you know, month. I think he lasted maybe like, I want to say 48 hours before he passed away. But this literally thing was spinning so hard that it was literally burning him from the in, inside out. And I don't want to discourage anybody from LVADs because LVADs have saved a lot of lives and, you know, they have helped a lot of people. But this is the ICU, so we, we see the worst uh, are the worst. So what we did was actually we had to turn it off. And the crazy thing about it is, is when you turn an LVAD off, it makes this loud beeping noise to let you know that the LVAD is turned off and there's no way to turn the mechanism off. So it would go off every like 15 minutes, like super loud. The whole It goes across the whole unit and we had to literally go in there, press the button to mute it, and then wait 15 minutes. It will alarm again, press the button to mute it. So it was, it, it sucked and the family's there and the patient's trying to die peacefully and you got this, this going off every 15 minutes because this is a very rare occurrence. So there was no kind of mechanism in there to turn the alarm off. I'm not sure, this is like three years ago, four years ago, so I'm not sure if they updated it uh, from then, but these kind of things were, were like super, super rare. Like these things don't really occur. You don't really have anything like this because usually people take care of them themselves fairly well that the LVAD doesn't try to clot itself off because of like the poor anti anti anticoagulation you've been giving yourself. Yeah. And he wasn't even very old, it's just very unfortunate he didn't take care of himself. And it's just, it's what it is. It was shitty seeing him in, in that state. He was in so much pain and it was just, Ever, ever since I saw that person, I'm just like, I'm never going to get an LVAD. That's, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so cool. Uh, we did a couple of, we did an episode a couple of podcasts ago. It's called, titled The First Artificial Heart Transplant. And it's an Italian company that actually created a device that's different from the VAD, which uh, is like artificially pumping blood in like the natural motion to prevent a centrifuge uh, effect. So you're not hemolyzing. And then also the the walls of that artificial heart was um, encoded with like uh, some kind of natural cells where they would start growing like an endothelial layer, and you you wouldn't need to get anticoagulants mm -hmm. for it. So it's cool. How, like we're revolutionizing uh, healthcare and aspects where like, hey, you have this device that's creating creating so much issues. Now we're slowly getting into artificial devices where it's going to prevent like half those problems from right. happening. Another one so, that I forgot to mention here, mm -hmm. but Impellas also do something similar to, to LVADs, except with Impellas, you can't go home. So that's why, you know, we have these VADs that, that Impellas are smaller, they're a little bit neater, but like I said, they can't, you can't go home on an Impella, you go home on, on, yeah. a, on a VAD. And also I read last week while we were at work, uh, there was a first artificial pig to human heart transplant. So they took a heart out of a pig. Dope and put it into a human, which is, which is pretty crazy, which is pretty interesting because isn't, well, not anymore, but heparin used to be made from, from pork, right? It's still made out still, of, yeah. And then I know if the insulin first was, we used to use pig insulin as well. Now it's now it's a synthetic insulin, but it's crazy how similar we are to pigs, you know, and some shit. Hey man, you can get a piggy valve and it works. Mm -hmm. So some medications when it comes to the heart and everything we're talking about in the cardiac section here is the first one is ACE angiotensin converting enzymes. Your, these drugs are basically relaxing the blood vessels to lower your blood pressure. And it's also gonna improve blood flow and reduce the strain of the heart. So your, all your prills, this lisinopril, enalopril, all those medications, that's it. Uh, you're gonna have some patients that are maybe allergic to the prills and you're going to get the angiotensin two receptor blockers, which uh, almost has the same mechanism, but it's a blocker of the receptor instead of the enzyme. I know one common side effect of ACE inhibitors is cough. And usually when you have that cough, they switch you from the ACE to the angiotensin 2 receptor blockers. And same with uh, black people. For some reason, they don't tolerate ACE inhibitors as well as, as, as white people. They get that cough and they get some other reaction associated with it. A lot of times I know black people, they're, they're on the angiotensin uh, 2 receptor blockers instead yeah. of ACE. I learned from nursing school back in the day. <laughs> and all those angiotensins are the low sartins, val sartin, all the artins. Uh, you have your beta blockers, which do, does two things. It slows the heart rate and it also increases the contractility. So your heart is actually functioning and improving. So sometimes with, um, with like uh, thoracic root aneurysms and things like that, in order to improve the contractility of the heart and the function, they're gonna give you a, um, a beta blocker. 
Um, and then in some cases, it actually helps you live longer and all those studies. So it does that. Those are your low pressors, metoprolol, bi bisoprol, anything with RLOL there. Uh, you have your diuretics, which are the water pills like Lasix and other things you might go at home. And this is preventing the extra fluid from building up. So as you know, salt follows water. That's why you want to be on a low sodium diet, usually a heart healthy diet. And any extra output into the, the pump is going to create more um, resistant. It's going to give it a harder time to pump. So you want to offload that water. And that's what diuretics are for. Um, sometimes you have to watch out for diuretics because, of course, your kidneys are going to pump out extra potassium and magnesium. So you might go on like um, aldosterone antagonists. This is like your spironolactone, which is potassium sparing diuretics. Um, it depend, sometimes you're on both, depends mm -hmm. on what happens. I think it like affects like the loop of Henley or whatever it was yeah. back in uh, nursing school. I remember that. And there are some real strong ones. Like if you're on Bumex and stuff, and we don't really, I haven't given it, you know, for a minute here, but in Chicago, we used to give it all the time. It's like a really, really strong order. If you're on a Bumex drip, like we got to, yeah, and you're in probably really bad, bad heart failure. We got to dry your ass up real quick. Yeah, but might as well connect the tube and the Foley into the bathroom because you're dumping out yeah, so much. Might, and the way they pull they pull Foley's here, dude, there's no way you're pulling that Foley if you're on Bumex drip. Yeah. Uh, with those medications, the spirolactones, you have to be careful about potassium and foods that are high in potassium because you could have um, hyperkalemia from that. Hmm. Uh, you have your positive inotropes. Uh, usually those are patients post heart failure and all the procedures that we listed that might go home on like a drip or something that's giving a continuous like um, primacore and all that, right? Yeah. To help with um, heart failure when you actually need that drip to sustain. And that helps with um, contractility and helps with a more efficient uh, blood flow and also helps maintain a blood pressure. Or sometimes if it's like the uh, the kidney patients and they have heart failure, sometimes we're going to keep giving them imidadrin, imidadrin mm -hmm. to try to get them off the pressors or whatever it is, and they could just kind of be on their way. And that helps to artificially uh, stimulate the blood pressure. Um, oh, dobutamine, that's what it's called. Mm -hmm. uh, you have your digoxin. So that one is an older medication that basically helps with the contractility and strengthening the, the heart. So it reduces heart failure symptoms and the, the systolic heart failure. Yeah, Dig, Dig was like a miracle pill back in the day because like Dig is very interesting because it slows down your heart rate and it does decrease your blood pressure like a beta blocker, but also helps with the contra contractility. You know, that's crazy because like beta blockers, they're only going to gonna lower your, your, your numbers, you could say. Your heart rate's going to get lowered and your vessels are going to relax. So it's going to drive blood pressure. But Dig does those two things. But it doesn't really act as strongly on your vessels, but it actually improves the contractility and also lowers your heart rate. So it's very, it's very efficient because you're slowing your heart rate, but also making it pump real hard and really good. And then there's some two other medications that I, that I looked up that are kind of new, uh, a combination of hydralazine and isosorbide. So it's interesting because a lot of our patients, and I just note, I realize it right now while scripting this, a lot of our patients at my hospital, they're on a hydralazine scheduled and isosorbide. But I guess there's like a new medication that, that's combined of both. both. But everybody was usually on hydralazine and isosorbide. Um, it just helped really well with, with the heart failure. It helps with relaxed blood vessel. It's not like our first line, but it's something that, that we give uh, fairly commonly. And it just helps. It's beneficial because it has that like beta blocker and ACE, in, ACE inhibitor kind of um, vibe in it where it's going to relax your vessels bring down the heart rate and also you have the hydralazine as well which is going to also relax your body and bring on bring down the blood pressure because sometimes we can give you a lot of medications and um it still might not work so sometimes instead of giving like a hundred of metoprolol you might want to give hydralazine and something else and that might work, work better because you don't want to like give too much of one medication because then you're going to completely shut down damp aspect of your heart because if you give too much um dig for example or too much metoprolol you're going to have you're gonna have somebody go into cardiac arrest because their heart's not gonna be able to beat. So you gotta kind of figure out like a nice little medium for, for all these people. Another drug is, uh, hmm, I don't know how you pronounce, a lot of Vs here, Verteguat. Uh, it's a newer medication for chronic heart failure. I guess they take it once a day uh, and it's supposed to reduce the risk of, of heart failure symptoms in individuals. I didn't do too much research on it, but the studies that they have is if you give this, um, 
vertigo, vertigo medication versus a placebo that's inactive, the people that are getting the actual medication tend to live longer and happier than those that get an inactive a, inactive pill. Good. Some, some yeah. new, yeah. And I've never given it. I've never heard about it. It's the first time I've ever seen it. So we'll see. Maybe we'll see a commercial for it. We'll yeah, give it a, blood, a, a bed bath or something today. And we're going to go into arrhythmias. And arrhythmias are an irregular heart rhythm. Maybe your heart is beating too fast, too slow, or it has a funky irregular rhythm. So it could be either or. Um, arrhythmias basically can affect how your heart works. And sometimes it might cause a pumping issue where you're not pumping enough blood. Uh, so there's different types of treatments. For example, for SVT, if you're supraventricular arrhythmias, you might do the vagal maneuver to stop the fast beat from, um, and that what that does, it uh, works on a uh, central nervous system and it actually stimulates the vagus nerve and that's gonna cause the heart rate to slow down. Uh, sometimes without SVT, your patient could do a vagal maneuver when they're for example straining to poop or something and that actually could cause a mm -hmm. adverse reaction they could just faint and have a syncopal episode yeah i had a patient have that happen to me where he um bared down and while well, taking a shit in the toilet and this was one of those patients where it's like damn should i take him to the bathroom should i not mm -hmm. because like it's always scheduled taking a person with heart failure into the bathroom especially when they have like these arrhythmias and he was in a, in a bathroom because every every um every um patient room had a had a toilet it was very nice rooms so they had that convenience so you just walk them like five steps and they'd be able to drop a deuce in the, in the toilet you know and he went there he was chilling and he's like he's like Ugh. and i was like oh fuck dude I, I told him i told him like you know when you use the bathroom just don't bear down real hard don't strain just let it come out and he's like yeah, yeah i could do it i guess where i'll do it i'll do it and i hear that Ugh. and then all of a sudden like like i look in the room and he's like you know whoever's watching on a video you know Whoever's not watching the video, you can't see this, but he's just like leaning forward and like almost collapsed. And I like catch him with like one 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 hand and he like lands on my chest and I bring him up and I like shake him and he wakes up, he's fine. And then I'm like, all right, you're done taking a shower. And then the scary thing is like, now I gotta walk this guy back to the to the, to the bed. And it's five steps, not far, but it's still scary as fuck. And like, so I have a nurse c come in and help me out. And we like, you know, helped him up. And then like, he goes by, th by the bed and he's like, and he like, I don't know if he like f farts or some shit, but he bears down again and he, and he does it again. So I don't know if you're trying to relieve gas or whatever. And same thing happens. And we just throw him on the bed and like wake him up again. I'm like, all right, you're not going to go to the bathroom anymore. It's that effective. I mean, it doesn't work all the time, but it's just like a, a first, first level thing you could do. Which is just, hey, hold, like try to pretend like you're taking a shit, you know, in the bed. You're going to be like in the bed. It's like, yeah, you're not going to shit your pants. Just, just do it because you're trying to get your heart rate normal. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. What you could also do if you have a sedated patient or intubated and, and paralyzed or whatever, you could put cold water into their ear and it uh, does the same thing. So I know one time we had a patient like that uh, that were like, hey, um, it was like a teaching moment. The patient was like kind of almost like we were keeping him alive because the family wanted to wait a few more days so they, they could decide and spend some more time with him before we kind of withdraw care. So we had, we had to do something, you know. So and we didn't want to be too aggressive and everything right there. There's not going to be any kind of surgical intervention. So we're like, hey, let's just put this water, this syringe filled with water and ice, keep it by the bedside in case they go into arrhythmia, we'll just pop in his ear and we'll see what happens. And we're like, okay, cool, we're waiting on there. And, and it happened, yeah, I was there and then we shot that cold water in, in their ear and they came out of the arrhythmia. And I was like, oh shit, I never, I never would have cool. thought to ever think of that like that. But we had some experienced nurses and we did it and it's like, oh shit, wow. One time in Santa Monica, one of the intensivists also did a cardiac thump. Mm. So it, it wasn't successful in his case, but that you could just basically make like a fist and just hit that damn chest as hard as you can to um, get get out of the arrhythmia. Yeah, I uh, had the next thing. I didn't get a chance to do a cardiac thump, but there was just one guy in day shift. You know, I'm giving him a shout out, Brett. Oh, this 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 big army dude. You know, like Jack. He's like I don't know, a little bit shorter than me, or maybe like five six or whatever. Always wore like baby gap scrubs. You know, they're always small, so they're always tight. He's always shooting shoot on his guns, but he's huge. Like baby I don't wanna, gap, huh? Yeah. <laughs> like I don't I don't, don't want to fuck with him, dude. And he's like, you know, he's a marine and shit back in the day, so he's fucking like you know with it, and then like. We're on night shift and, you know, somebody tells me and they're like, yeah, man, it's crazy. Like I've seen Brett do cardiac thump where he literally took his palm and he smacked on a patient's chest and he came out of his, his arrhythmia. It's fucking crazy. I haven't seen it done. I've never done it. But like, like ever, ever since he did that, you probably felt like the biggest fucking big shot ever. The whole fucking hospital dude that somebody did a, did a cardiac thump. He's one of those guys successful. too that'll, that'll brag about it, you know, because he orientated me, me uh, when I was... Um, 
a new grad nurse and like I, I knew his personality so it's like he's telling all his cool stories uh, how he did this how he did that so it's like after that cardiac thump everybody fucking knew who Brett was with the, with the cardiac thump you know with some shallow physicians knew like oh shit or like damn you don't want to do the cardiac thumps like yeah 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 yeah, yeah, bro. Fucking some shit. Yeah, to total yeah, yeah. frat boy there. Yeah, dude. He'd, funny, he'd be perfect for that nurse yeah. shirt you're wearing. Yeah, he's smart. He's <laughs> smart as fuck. This guy's straight fucking business. Like he's one of he's a fucking really good nurse. He's just a lot of people all kind of bump heads with him because of very very high ego. So you just gotta let him do his thing, you know. Yeah. The next thing you want to do is, or next line of treatment you can do with an arrhythmia is a cardio version, and that's a method to reset the heart rhythm. Sometimes you're gonna do uh, pads, or maybe you're doing a TEE, a trans echocardiogram, where you could do a more invasive cardio version, and you're basically gonna shock the rhythm out of its funky arrhythmia back into a regular rhythm. Yeah, so if you're a nurse listening to this, if you're gonna cardio vert somebody, make sure you give them a little bit of sedation. Don't just do it because uh, I never, I mean, I never did, did anything like that, but I know a patient, a few times, a patient's ICD went off you know, in, in the hospital, so they got shocked. And the guy told me he literally feels like there's a horse kicking you in the chest and super uncomfortable. So, so imagine like you're, you're, and your AICD and your or your pacemaker or whatever. I mean, your AICD is gonna shock you. So if your AICD it's programmed to a certain setting, a certain amount of joules. And at the hospital that I was working in, there because there's like like a debate: should you start at like 120 joules, then go up to 160, then go up to you know to 180, 200? There's like either that way you could do, or you could do the method that we did is like crank it up. You got one shot to bring to bring them back, you know, and I, I like like that three more than going up because like, why would you want to have to shock somebody three times before you get them out of the rhythm? I rather prefer just crank it up to one eighty or whatever jewels uh, your 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 machine does and just and just hit them with that. But it literally feels like the guy literally says like it feels like you're getting punched and kicked by a horse in, in the chest. So sedate him a little bit if you know you're gonna you're gonna do it. It's not Be a like patient super advocate and yeah. get some sedation on yeah. board. The next one is a a catheter ablation. This is a procedure where your your physician is going to literally create scar tissue uh, and tiny scars on the heart that's going to prevent um, like the um, electronic system of the heart from creating these arrhythmias. So you're basically going to block electrical signals from going to a certain part and that in theory is going to restore the the heart rate because you have like you have a heartbeat. So your in, your internal pacemaker, the SA node, that's the one that dictates um, on on what to do. But the thing is that your heart is always going to go like the electricity of your heart is always going to follow the quickest one. So even though your SA node might be good, there might be these random electrical outputs coming out. So your SA node is like chilling at seventy; it's always doing seventy. But that sometimes there's other parts of your heart that start doing eighty. 90 so those are going to take over and the issue becomes if like you're getting if you're getting your heart rate into like the 100 110 consistently that's not compatible and sustainable with life you can do that for so long like our heart rate can't be in the 150s forever you know so like what we go what we do is we literally burn burn that little area that's causing this issue they, you know they do a bunch of tests they figure out what's actually causing this because we could burn these little pieces and then your SA node or your AV node which is second in charge can take over and you might not need kind of any other other kind of um, procedures or anything like that. Because like I said, your heart is always going to follow the the highest heart rate, you could say. that That's like, it's like, it's like the baseline is always going to be that. So it might, it might not necessarily be a, an essay node issue. It might just be some other kind of inputs and outputs coming from other parts of your heart. So we just got to burn those bad boys off. Um, a really cool one that I learned about recently is the um, MACE procedure, which is instead of like just burning the this one area, you're kind of burning like a, there's a they map it out and they burn like the um, like the whole system of these these misfires you could say we don't it does not done very often because it's a little bit more more in, intensive but instead of like burning one or two spots you're like burning a whole conductive conductive system so if you go on Google and type in mace procedure there's literally like it shows you like what areas of the heart they burn it's really very interesting um, and of course your arrhythmias can be so bad where you might need a coronary artery bypass because um, you know, this could be, so what could happen is, for example, your SA node, you know, how we mentioned, that's like the main pacemaker of your heart, your natural one, that could get damaged with with uh, any kind of heart attack or any kind of cardiac issues. So we might need to reperfuse that area and um, then we could fix that issue because your arrhythmias could stem from different kinds of things. You know how we said a heart failure could stem from different things? So could your, your um, arrhythmias. So the next one here we have is heart valve problems. Uh, this is something fairly common. So 
your heart valve issues, they can be stenotic where they're not able to open and close uh, properly. You could have a uh, regurg of the mitral valve or tricuspidal valve where the valves aren't closing properly and it's causing a backflow of, of blood. Or um, the third one, there's a third one. There is stenosis, regurg, and there's one more, isn't there? Prolapse. Prolapse. Yeah, prolapse is like, I'm not sure if you guys ever had a patient with like a uterine prolapse where it's just kind of like weak and just kind of flimsy and, and does whatever it wants. So that's going to be an issue because you then you're mixing oxygenated blood and non-oxygenated blood and then you're going to a whole slew of problems where you're not giving out proper cardiac outputs, so you're not perfusing your vessels. So something that we, that we have to fix. A lot of times this is surgical interventions. The most common one that I see, especially now, is TAVERS, which if it's your aortic valve, it's called a transcatheter aortic valve replacement where they don't open you up like they do back in the day. Uh, they go through, it's wire guided, and they literally replace it with, with this wire. And a lot of times they, a lot of times with these valve replacements in general, like the mitral or tricuspid, they also replace, I think it's called the, the annulus. That's the thing that Matt mentioned. A uh, little circle thing that goes around the valve. Yeah, that usually gets replaced as, as well. You um, know what I randomly thought about? Mm -hmm. We're talking about all these procedures on the heart, and another thing that they do, and this is more for like strokes, is they do the whole Watchman procedure. Mm -hmm. So like you have like this in this left atrium, have like this uh, appendage, and they basically put a device that's like a parachute, and it's just catching and preventing clots from going into that little space. Mm -hmm. So it's more for a procedure. Uh, for patients that have AFib, they maybe did already a maze procedure and they're still in that rhythm. So you want to prevent any blood clots from forming and increasing your chance of uh, getting a stroke. Yeah. Yeah. So with the valves, you could either get a uh, replacement of a valve that's, uh, you like mentioned, from a pig, where you're not going to need really anticoagulation. But usually you're going to, usually if your cardiovascular, if you have, a, if your cardiovascular disease is, is kind of an issue, they're gonna probably put you on that coagulants in general because maybe you have other problems going on. But if you just get the pig valve uh, and you don't have any other kind of cardiac issues, you don't have to have anticoagulants. But if you get an artificial valve, then you're gonna be on anticoagulants for the rest of your life because it's a foreign device. So naturally, whatever's foreign, your body's gonna attack it. And in this sense, since it's not like a, a virus or bacteria, it's going to attack it with its platelets and our coagulation system. So it's going to just stick onto it and kind of almost like make a barrier around it to, to make it seem like it's ours. So it's going to lead to other clots. That's why you got to be on forever anticoagulants. Yeah. And some medica uh, cardiac medications for these procedures, and we're not going to go into all of them in depth because we mentioned a few of them they're repeating. So one is anticoagulants, just like Pete mentioned. You could be on Coumadin or Plavix. Those are the two. Uh, main one, you have your ACE inhibitors. You have the angiotensins two as well that we talked about. Uh, you also have the angiotensin receptor nepressin inhibitors, which is uh, different, and it's a natural substance um, in the body, and it creates a natural effect where the arteries are opening and blood flow is happening and reduces salt retention. Mm. Uh, this is a new one that I'm not very familiar with. You have your beta blockers. Then you have the combined alpha and beta blockers, which is sometimes a drip, beta one, beta two, uh, depending on what's happening or if you're trying to manage a patient with like hypertensive urgency. Uh, you have your calcium channel blockers, of course, which is uh, going to relax a smooth muscle because it prevents the, the, uh, the movement of calcium into your cells and the heart and the blood vessels. Uh, you have various cholesterol lowering medications. Those are going to be your statins and you're going to prevent uh, plaque basically from forming because you're going to lower uh, cholesterol levels in the liver. Mm -hmm. uh, those are those are up to debate sometimes. Uh, honestly, I wasn't a fan of stents. Like my dad was taking them and he had like um, muscle pains and he couldn't get up uh, with like the ladder and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So he stopped taking them. I just wanna make one quick note here. Uh, people get put on anticoagulants and there's also antiplatelets. So if you get like Coumadin, that's an anticoagulant because it affects like your INR and those kind of levels versus antiplatelet like a Plavix. Uh, it's going to just uh, prevent platelet aggregation. So it's just going to prevent the platelets from kind of uh, bundling up together, not necessarily affecting the, the clotting cascade like an anticoagulant would. Okay. Uh, you have your DIG. So we talked about that, how it increased the, the force and the contraction of the heart without lowering the blood pressure. Uh, you have your diuretics. So same thing, preventing the fluid buildup 
in the vasculature, which is going to create more issues for the pump, aka the heart. You have your vasodilators, which relaxes the blood vessels, which helps with the supply of blood and oxygenating properly, as well as reducing its um, workload of the heart. Uh, that's like the main thing there. Vasodilators, you could take them by pill, and so a lot a lot of times uh, physicians will just order it with like that little cool test strip, which blew my mind when I first like saw it. So mm -hmm. it's usually like apply a half an inch and you just like squirt this... Um, the vasodilator fluid, usually nitroglycerin, and you just put the patch on the mm. on the chest, tape it up, and they're good to go, and it lowers the, the blood pressure because it's transdermal. Yeah, sometimes we even give the dilators uh, through like the vents, but if people get put on nitric oxide, it's a vasodilator, so it helps open up those the pulmonary vasculature, which is pretty cool. So if you see like a patient on a vent that's getting nitric oxide, we're just trying to open up those those arteries and, and, those, and those veins. And even like last supplements, like if you're pre-workouts, they a lot of times have nitric oxide too, just the vasodilator. Nitric oxide is also prevalent in, uh, in beets, any kind of red color vegetables, uh, very, very high in dose. If you want to get a quick little pump, you know, eat some beets before the gym. Yeah, and, and it's cool because like in Santa Monica, we didn't put patients on uh, nitric oxide at all. They're on the uh, epiprestinol mm -hmm. versus here they we're just doing nitric uh, oxide so i don't know if it's like a issue with resources i don't know which one is more therapeutic or more evidence-based but maybe the one that they were doing santa monica it might be like a vasodilator plus like something else maybe you know maybe it's I, more effective for, pul yeah. for pulmonary hypertension yeah, who, knows? who knows yeah now we're just gonna go over real quick uh, a heart disease fact sheet so you mentioned mm -hmm. in the beginning of the episode cardiovascular disease is the number one killer in america uh one in five people have some type of cardiovascular disease, and there's about 3 million deaths in the U.S., and a cardiovascular disease alone accounts for about uh, a fourth of them. One person dies of cardiovascular disease in the U.S. every 36 seconds. So I know there's this whole C19 thing going on, but you guys got to understand that every, one person dies from cardiovascular disease every 36 seconds, and this has been going on for the last 50 plus years. No one said it's a pandemic. Yep. Mm, yeah, we, no one no one talks about that, and it's crazy. This is... um almost a pandemic that we've kind of done to ourselves as consumers and but we're not the only ones to blame we're all so we also should point the finger at fast food companies and the whole cdc and the whole um people that do these mandates and are supposed to have our our best interest in mind because they're the ones that kind of allowed all this to happen to, to begin with now fast food has become a staple in america and it's never going going to change so cardiovascular disease i believe it kills um what number that would they say in 2019, um, and coronary heart disease um, is a multi happened heart disease that accounts for 360,000 um, people in the U.S. in 2018, which is which is wild. That's that's just coronary heart disease in, in general. That's just coronary. That's not it's not counting hypertension. It's not counting um, you know diabetes. Not counting any other. Uh, people that suffer heart attacks, any, anything like that, it's literally just coronary artery disease. And that's when your coronaries are get occluded. And then those usually lead to heart attacks. And that's what usually leads to like the heart failures and all that. All those really scary and intense cardiovascular diseases. Yeah, and it's Very crazy because like heart attack, you have somebody every 40 seconds mm. dealing with a heart attack. And there was 805,000 people that died from heart disease in America in 2019 and look at like C19 mm. that number almost barely got there and like we're like freaking out we're like when like a thousand people died but why is nobody freaking out there's people continuously yeah. dying um, from this you know and the scary stat is that one in five heart attacks are silent and the damage is done the person's not aware of it and then like look at this whole episode we talked about there's so much complications mm. that goes with heart disease heart failure and it's a life lifelong disease that you're going to be stuck with and dealing. Yeah, and a financial perspective, um, from 2016 to 2017, uh, the the cost for heart disease in the U.S. is 363 billion dollars, and that's 2016 to 2017. I tried to look up the 2019 or the 2018 numbers, but I guess they haven't calculated them. But I guarantee you, it's probably a lot higher than that. If it was 363 billion in 2016, 2017, it's probably like almost half a half a trillion now. Which is yeah. wild. If I mean, you imagine healthcare if, takes up a huge part of our GDP. Yeah. So it's like crazy, like $363 billion into into cardiovascular disease health that we got to treat these people. And imagine how much money people are spending on, on fast food, probably that same amount, which is, which is crazy. It's just like, 
I wonder how much this would drop if we would just eliminate fast food. People would probably be able to save more money and because in the long run, they're living a healthier, better life, which is going to you know, cut the cost of them being ha having to be <coughs> hospitalized, the cost of our, our their health insurance and all that stuff. If you could just yeah. if you just just eat healthy, if you could just eat healthy, like you don't have to exercise like a whole like a whole lot. If you eat healthy and like within your, you could say, k calorie workload, like you're not gonna really suffer cardiovascular disease very much. Yeah, even looking at the race of ethnicity. So, if you are unfortunately black. You have the highest chance of death, which is 23.5%. Next is white, 23.7%. And in general, the average medium is 23.4%. So uh, scary, scary things. And if when we looked at the percentages between men and women, men have a higher chance of death in every ethnicity group. Uh, the Actually, which is interesting is the average, yeah, the average of men is 24.4% versus women 22.3 percent but they're still very close it, it just shows that like cardiovascular disease is one of those diseases where it's like like for example breast cancer there yeah men get breast cancer but women get breast cancer at a way higher rate and cardiovascular disease doesn't matter if you're male or female it doesn't it just matters about your lifestyle which is crazy and it doesn't matter about what ethnicity like i know diabetes you're pro you're more prone to being diabetic if you're you know hispanic or, or black but if you think about it, it's really based on diet, you know. But here, cardiovascular disease, it's, numbers are, are more close niche. So it, it doesn't matter white, black, green, blue, yellow, purple. It doesn't matter. Like cardiovascular disease is, is going to fuck you up just because you're not eating healthy, you're not exercising. It doesn't matter. You, you know, just because I like, say you're white, you, you have a less likelihood. It's not really what, what's showing. Maybe like two percentages points, but is that really a, a significant number? No. Those are, those are the stats, mm -hmm. but it could, get you, it could get you. It could get anybody. Anybody, dude. Yeah, and what's also crazy is hypertension. Like that's probably the most um, most prevalent thing that leads to this cardiovascular disease. And 116 million people had car had hypertension in 2017, and it's probably about the same, if not more, now. That's almost a third of the U.S. population is having hypertension. Yeah, and it's interesting because just recently, a few years ago, the American Heart Association had to lower its limits of what's considered hypertension it used to be like 140 over 90 but because hypertension is such a huge risk factor for all this unfolding that actually the guideline is now if you're 130 over 80 and above you're considered to be in the um you're already uh hypertension stage one mm -hmm. and pre-hypertension is anything like in the in the 120 so a uh, scary guideline, especially like that, you know, there's an American report that one in five people have reports of uh, only of adequate physical activity. Mm -hmm. So the four out of five people average in America don't get enough cardiovascular activity. That's actually the most important thing that you can do to preventing things like this. Yeah, and we'll you go know, into movement, this. Movement is life. Yeah, and we'll go into this because I was curious, like, if only one out of five Americans are hitting the required activity guidelines, so I'm thinking like, what the hell are these guidelines going to be? Is it like 20 hours a week? Like, what are these guidelines? Like, how, how is that only one in five Americans are, are, are doing this? So I'm, I actually looked at the guidelines uh, myself. And then for anybody that's adult, so it's above the age of 18. So for substantial health benefits, adults should do at least 150 minutes, which is two and a half hours to five hours of moderate intense exercise a week. So all you have to do is up to five hours a week, which is less than an hour a day. And that's already providing you substantial benefits. And if you want even greater uh, benefits, you could do 75 minutes to two hours and 30. So you could, you could, if you want even greater benefits, you could do an hour and 15 to two hours and 30 minutes of vigorous, high intensity aerobic exercise. And that's going to give you even more benefits. But the minimal they're asking you to do is five hours a week. That's less than an hour a day. You could literally, you could literally just go to the gym five days a week and take two off days just for an hour go on a treadmill for like an hour, do some weightlifting or whatever. That's all you have to do. And only one out of five people were able to attain this, which really shows you like how bad of a place we are as, as you know, people of this amazing country of America, you know? Yeah, everybody needs to have a hobby of physical activity. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is, you have to get physically active. So you need to develop a, ha a habit of it and create some kind of life satisfaction behind exercising. You have to change your belief on what exercising is. You know, a lot of people are like dr 
dragging their feet going to the gym like you have to fall in love with it because of what it's doing and of you know how important it is especially if you look at the statistic that like by 2035 they're estimating the healthcare system is going to uh, have a debt of 1.1 trillion dollars due to cardiovascular disease and right now we're at 232 billion that's going to quadruple almost we need to do something about it now all, all comes just like we talk about every single damn podcast episode it's, it's accountability and self-responsibility because clearly the government doesn't have best interests like peter mentioned imagine if we banned fast food what kind of benefit that would do mm -hmm. unfortunately that's not going to happen because there's consumerism there's all these corporations that are kind of running america not the government itself they're not going to put a ban like that there's always yeah like it's it, it's you know i could freaking play the world's smallest violin and just talk about this shit like yeah. the government's not going to do anything in your own interest if it doesn't benefit capitalism yeah long story short you know what i'm saying yeah. the, just like the whole thing with like with cars now they're going to put kill switches by uh 2026 and all that like there's no benefit in it for us to do anything it's always just constricting constricting and reducing and yeah. yeah, but that's a whole nother subject that we right. could talk about. <laughs> yeah, for for older adults that are that are healthy and don't have severe chronic issues, uh, it is recommended that they do 150 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic activity a week. So that's a little over uh, two hours. And what's what's cool is, guys, we have over 150 episodes of the couple nurses. We have over 80 episodes on couple news. All you gotta do is Monday through Friday, go to the gym, press play on Spotify or Apple. This is our whole episode while working out and you can go home and you're going to be healthy as fuck. You're not going to have any wow, kind of... Wow, what a goal for 2022. And some shit, guys. We're doing everybody a favor, you know? Like, you know, what what better things can you can you do than, you know, go exercise for 40 minutes a day, five days a week while listening to a couple of nurses, you know, rant about shit, you know, and you learn. You know? Hell yeah. It is what it is. Uh, some diet modifications are going to affect cardiovascular disease. One of the big things that we have been working on and the FDA and all that are reducing it is trans fats. And that's basically a artificial fatty acid that the industry has been using to make food taste better. It's basically adding hydrogen to liquid vegetable oils to become more solids. Restaurants like it because it creates better texture, improves taste, and they also could reduce that oil. Uh, there, it's not completely illegal, even though there's a direct correlation between trans fats and uh, heart disease. Uh, and there's a recommendation for you, ideally get less than two grams in your diet per day, closer to zero, the better. The FDA recommends that products contain less than 0 0.5 grams per serving size. And this is where it's kind of like, it's messed up because a lot the the population doesn't know it. Like if you if you have pizza and the serving size is one sixth and if it's less than 0 0.5 grams in that serving size, technically the company could list it as zero. But now if you're adding the whole pizza, all six slices, let's just say an average American maybe could eat that. Now maybe you're consuming four or five grams of trans fats mm -hmm. that you didn't weren't even aware of it. There should be a fat ass slap on there on that box that says Five grams of trans fats leads to heart disease, just like the freaking cigarette companies have mm. it. But consumerism, right? We can't do that. So instead, they manipulate these serving sizes and make you think that you're um, eating healthy mm. or whatever it is. But anyways, fast food, donuts, pie crusts, cookies, crackers, margarines, all that stuff are going to have trans fats. Please reduce it and make some substances in, in your life for it. Yeah, all the, all the shittiest foods have trans fats. If you... Let's see. I, I guarantee. You. So today we had a uh, we had the Popeyes uh, spicy chicken sandwich, and then I also had some tenders. I guarantee you, there's probably like 0.4 grams of trans fats in the sandwich, and probably 0.4 grams of trans fats in those tenders. So that's already that's already 0.8. And we're planning on eating some pizza today, which is going to be some, which is going to be another probably 0.4. Which if that's I'm already at one point two if you think about it, and if I decide to eat some you know some cookies or whatever, some plaque, dude. another point four. That's one point six, dude. I'm fucking point four. I, I can't eat. I can't. I gotta be easy for the next next fucking eight hours. You know, I can't be. I can't even have a sandwich anymore with muscle, dude, with butter. You know, yeah. I can't. But what's interesting is that trans fats are also naturally occurring. So milk is gonna have trans fats, and so is butter. Natural butter is also gonna have trans fats, but. 
currently it's 2022 and there has not been any research done comparing tra artificial trans fats and trans fats that are naturally occurring. No one's looking at that because I'm sure naturally occurring trans fats are going to have probably some, a little bit more of a positive aspect than artificial trans fats. And the thing is that the trans fats in milk, it's like 0.2 per, per cup. If you're not drinking the whole damn gallon of milk, you're fine, you know. The trans fats do do occur in nature and they are in, in this food, but it's in, it's in a small amount where you're not going to have a whole daily value of trans fats in the milk. Like you could you could down a whole box of cookies easy and get the two grams of trans fats, but you can't down a whole gallon of milk easy and get those two grams of trans fats. Yet. And that's where the that's where the beauty of like of like nature is, where it puts these things that you need only in small amounts if you even need them in something that you can't fully eat. Like you can't eat a whole three sticks of butter, right? you'd fucking, you wouldn't be able to, you'd vomit. You'd vomit, yeah. and then you would vomit the 0.4 that, that you need. So you'd be good because you'd be at, <laughs> you at, point, at one point, yeah. zero. You'd be at 1.6 instead of that two, so you'd be, you'd be chilling. So there's naturally occurring ones. And I just want to point out a study that was done in Iran. So it looked at 35,924 Iranian individuals and looked at their trans fat consumption. And they concluded that on average, those people ate about 14 grams per 1,000 k, k calories of trans fats. Um, and it accounted for trans fats accounted for 33% of their total diet consumption, which is with total fat in a diet consumption, which is a lot. That, that's a lot. I was very surprised. And they concluded that 39% uh, of the coronary heart disease events could have been prevented if the trans fatty acids were replaced with unsaturated fatty acids. 39%. So it's saying that, you know, it's a huge percentage. 10,000 of those people could have been saved if they would ease up on their trans fat consumption. And think about it, if they're eating 14 grams on average per person of trans fats, they're eating pretty unhealthy food because it takes a lot to get 14 grams. Like we did, we discussed here in America, like a serving size of pizza is 0.4. So they're, they're eating a lot of these unhealthy trans fats. So, so I guarantee you, if you just limit the trans fats and fix up their diet, that would be a whole lot higher than 39%. Because that's just calling for trans fats. Because they're already eating. Think about it. If they're eating already fourteen grams of trans fats, imagine how trash of a diet these people are having. Where if you completely correct it, you're not just the trans fats, but other factors, you're gonna be goddamn like nine nine point nine six percent. Like fucking the chance of you not dying with C nineteen when you're healthy. You know. Yeah, and that's un that's unfortunate that their government is not looking at that, not doing anything about it. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if you're not a farmer, you're not creating your own food and the public only has access to this, then your your disadvantage in society is being born into it. Yeah, but if you go into like a Middle Eastern restaurant, a lot of them do have like a lot of breads, a lot of rices, a lot of very carb dense dense foods. But then again, if they don't have any restrictions on, you know, cooking with with trans fats in in in, in Iran, well then, you know, this is what's going to happen. You're you're taking someone that that's maybe doesn't have any trans fat in it, and you're frying it in, in a fryer that has trans fats, oh, and now you get now you got it. Yeah, that's what it is. All right, boys and girls. Guys. Hope you guys enjoyed this damn episode, and you guys stayed awake. <laughs> jam packed research here, man. Yeah, if you're listening to it at the gym, probably had a little bit of an extra workout today. Yeah, I hope you guys enjoy these episodes and gather as much knowledge as you can. If you find value in this podcast, of course, share with your loved ones. Maybe you're a nursing student that is going to take this part of the test or something, send it to your friends so they could study while they're studying and absorb more knowledge. And of course, thank you for your time because you can't get that back. Take care, guys. See Stop. you on the next one.